Camping, it's something many of us love to do, but it seems more often than not people are starting to experience and encounter some downright disturbing things while out camping with their friends and family. Welcome back to the swamp and welcome if you're new my friends. Today I'm going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true camping horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. As always, if you have an experience you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net. Now, I love camping, and I plan going very soon. Hopefully, I'm not going to see anything while primitive camping this year. Now, let's get into these creepy and allegedly true camping horror stories. Be sure to hit that like button and subscribe if you're new, and get ready to be spooked tonight. Hi, Swamp Dweller. My name is Alina, and here is my story. This happened in the summer of 2008 when I went to Russia on vacation. My ex-husband, his local friends, and I went camping near the Baikal River. We arrived and set up a camp. Three to four tents, about six to seven people, I can't remember exactly, but this doesn't really matter anyway. When we set up the fire, we grabbed our beer and prepared to enjoy our first night in nature. I loved being outdoors, but at that time, I began to feel strange. These places are the home to many local legends and myths, so I referred this to my rich and wild imagination. I didn't drink alcohol beforehand and went to pee about 40 to 50 meters away from the camp. When I started doing my thing, I understood I was not alone. Something or someone stood just two to three meters away from me. I was scared but tried not to panic. As my husband and squad were nearby, I could hear their noisy talking. I want to note that it was not a brief encounter with this action. It was more of a feeling that just lingered. Although I couldn't see anything, I could feel it. That's when I noticed a silhouette off to my right. It was short, about probably one and a half meters tall. It had black fur, I think, like an overgrown poodle. It was standing and just observing me. I was somehow paralyzed and couldn't look at that thing directly, just from the corner of my eyes. I can't describe the feeling but it was like some sort of dull dread that you analyze but can't rationalize. I knew it was more powerful than me. It had different vibrations. It felt wild. It did not feel like an animal, but it did feel part of nature. It could hurt me quickly if it wanted to, but I feel like it didn't have much intention. It was just studying me. I didn't want it to disappear as I was curious, but as my dread started to melt, it vanished. I could see it only when I was scared and when I took my emotions under control and heard the outer sounds, it seemingly was gone. Maybe I sound crazy or stupid, as no one believes me, but I was completely sober and okay with myself. When this happened, I was 100% sober of mind, is what I'm trying to say. This encounter with whatever this inhuman, personified nature spirit was, it wielded some wild power. It's something I'll never forget. To add, I'm convinced it was the spirit of a small territory, as locals say. It surely couldn't be the leading spirit of the lake called Burkan by the indigenous people. It should have been some spirit of the grove or alike. People even give these spirits offerings as shamanism is one of the three widely spread religions here. The other two are Buddhism and Orthodox Christianity. Thank you for sharing my story. I hope your project grows and we will have the possibility to enjoy your storytelling if it's possible. Please read this story if you plan to go on vacation soon. We made the mistake of trying to be adventurous, which cost more than we ever thought. My name is Liam and I am 18 years old. I have worked part-time jobs ever since I got into high school to be able to afford a vacation before going to college. I wanted to do this because once I left for college, I'd be stuck in my room studying or going to low-budget college parties, neither of which sounded great. Three of my best friends from high school also had the same idea. We had my friend, a petite Asian guy named Seth, and his parents, who immigrated from Japan. One of my friends I never thought I would have, Sarah. She was the daddy's girl. She was spoiled and always got what she wanted. And then we had my friend JJ, who was chill and loved cracking jokes to make people laugh. The four of us decided we wanted to go on vacation together. It would cost us less and we would spend more time with each other before we went our separate ways after high school. We were thinking of going where Seth suggested we should go, which was Japan. 
You're always talking about how you would love to see Japan, so why not go there? I'm sure my parents would love to if we could visit Japan. He said with a smile on his face. He always wanted to impress his parents, but he was right, we did want to visit Japan, and he would help us navigate because he could still speak Japanese. We all agreed to book our tickets for a flight to Japan on Friday morning after graduating. We spent the next couple of days packing up our stuff, and JJ said he had some camping equipment we would take there in case we decided to go camping. When Friday morning came, we were all waiting at the airport, excited to go vacation and explore. After a while, we got on the plane and the flight went smoothly. I was asleep for most of it. We landed and went to a hotel so that we could get ourselves rooms. We spent the rest of the day exploring the city and trying different street foods, and before we knew it, it was time for us to go back to our room and call it a night. The next day, we were feeling refreshed and ready to go for a day of exploration. We were at one of the street vendors that sold Dango when we decided to ask if there were any exciting locations for camping. He said there was a forest known for people committing suicide in it. The name was Akigahara, but he told us we weren't allowed to camp there, only visit for tours. As dumb and adventurous teenagers, we decided to go camping there. Not our first time breaking the rules, and we would find a nice secluded spot so no one would bother us or even know we were there. At first, Seth was against the idea saying we should respect the dead and not do what we were not supposed to do, but he quickly agreed after he saw that we were not letting go of the opportunity. We rented a car, bought some booze, a fire starting kit, and a survival knife in case anything attacked us. As the evening came, we started making our way to the forest. The drive took about 40 minutes, so it wasn't too bad. We had a lot to talk about. We got there as it started to get dark and we quickly made a fire and set up our tents where we would sleep. Next couple of hours, we spent talking and drinking and generally just having fun. We shared scary stories, and we honestly just had a good time. And then, it was time for us to go to bed. We put out the fire, and I got into my sleeping bag and dozed off. I woke up in the middle of the night. As I rubbed my eyes, I decided to see what time it was. The clock read 2.48 a.m., and I realized I needed to pee pretty badly. As I left my tent and made my way deeper into the woods, I thought I saw a figure of a person, but as I blinked again, it was gone. I shrugged it off as me being hungover and just seeing things. I finished my business and made my way back to the tent. I fell, and once again, I was awoken. I fell asleep, and once again, I was awoken, but I could hear something this time. It sounded like a muffled voice speaking in Japanese. Thinking it was Seth with a park ranger or something, I got out of my tent and I could see Seth at the edge of the forest. Based on his posture, I figured he wasn't peeing, so I thought he might have been sleepwalking. As I approached him, the voice became louder and more precise, indicating that it was indeed Seth speaking. Hey man, what are you up to? I asked, expecting him to either not answer because he was sleepwalking or be embarrassed that I caught him talking to himself in the middle of the night. Seth did stop speaking, but he didn't turn in my direction. He was looking out into the woods, not saying anything. As I moved a few steps forward, he turned towards me at a speed I never thought was possible. As he groaned, he jerked his hands off to the left side of his abdomen. Are you okay? I said, moving towards him. That's what I noticed what he was doing. He plunged our survival knife deep into his abdomen. He looked at me with a satisfying expression as he slid the knife horizontally across his stomach. I was frozen in fear, standing still in shock as my friend bled out in front of me. After I gained control of my body, I screamed. My lungs burned as I called again and again. JJ and Sarah woke up to see what was happening, and once they saw Seth, they screamed at the top of their lungs. We need to get the hell out of here, I said as I ran back to our camp to pack our stuff. Not even ten seconds into packing, I could hear JJ scream. No, Sarah, wh wh where are you going? He yelled. As I turned my head, I saw Sarah running into the woods. Crap. We must go after her, we can't just leave her alone in this forest, I exclaimed, nodding my head in the direction of which she ran. JJ shook his head as we ran after her, adrenaline pumping in our veins. We ran for about five minutes until we saw Sarah climbing a tree, almost at the top already. Sarah, get down, please, you don't want to do this, I said with a worried and panicked tone enveloping me. As she climbed the tree, she looked at me and JJ, again with a smile and a look of satisfaction as she let herself fall on top of her head from the tree. The sounds of bones snapping as her body hit limp and lifeless is something I'll never forget. We didn't say anything. We looked at the ground for five minutes. Ten minutes. I'm not even sure how long. 
We just sat there, our gaze meeting the ground beneath us. As we looked down, JJ pulled out a knife already covered with Seth's blood. I didn't even try to stop him. No, I was waiting for him to do it so I could have my turn. Just as he was about to pierce his abdomen, a figure emerged from the bush next to me and shoved JJ, who dropped his knife. The man said something in Japanese as he picked up JJ and gestured for us to follow him, and we did. We followed him back to what we assumed was his house. He made us some tea and started to speak. How many? How many have passed? The man said bluntly. I and JJ looked at each other, and we said, Two, in unison. This force makes people end their lives. It's not known for suicides for no reason. Every time someone spends more than six hours in this forest, the forest makes them commit suicide. He paused, meeting our gaze to make sure we were still listening. The reason it does this is that there was a tribe living here hundreds of years ago. After they were defeated and about to be wiped out, their shaman put a curse on the forest, making anyone who stayed here for prolonged periods to end their life. He said as I and JJ looked at each other after finishing our tea, I suggest you leave now. Leave for wherever you came from, and don't come back, he said as he got us back into town. It was already done at this point. When we got back, I and JJ packed our stuff, got a refund from the hotel for the last two nights, and got on a flight back home. We didn't say a word to the police. We didn't want to stay in that cursed place any longer. Two weeks have passed since that incident, and I just got news that JJ committed suicide. As I'm sitting here about to post this with my gun in my right hand, it doesn't seem like such a bad idea. When I was 15 or so, me and a group of my friends all slept over and camped at my friend's house. This dude lived in the most rural area of our town, basically in the middle of the woods, a house just absolutely surrounded by thick walls of trees. In the evening, we decided to go out into the woods to start a bonfire, so we packed up all of our materials and went straight into the center of the woods. I know, probably a dumb idea, with hindsight. On the way to our spot we decided to make our campfire at, he told us about how weird and creepy his woods are, and the numerous things he has seen. White, skinny figures peeking their heads around the shed, staring at him and running off when he looked at them, screaming in whispers from the woods. Figures watching him at all hours of the day, all that good stuff. It definitely set the mood well. By around 7 at night, we had a campfire set up and it was pitch black outside. As it was the middle of winter in New Hampshire, I can still remember how creepy the whole vibe was. You could not see a single thing besides the ring of light coming from our fire. Everything else was pitch black, just walls and walls of nothingness, and the sound of the forest was so quiet that it almost was deafeningly loud. We ended up needing more firewood or whatever we were using for the campfire, so my friend takes me with him to go get some from the woods. Without a flashlight or any light source, me and him walk about a mile and a half long on this trail, back to his house in complete and utter darkness. I don't know why we didn't just collect sticks, but he had a pile of wood at his house that he wanted to use. At first, it was all good. We were talking, joking with each other, having a good time just hanging out when the first noises started. He immediately made me stop talking. To my left and my right was a bunch of different sounds. Screaming, laughing, talking, whispering, shouting, people saying inaudible words. It sounded like there was something around 20 people around us. The natural night vision that we had was pretty okay at this point. I was used to the dark and I could somewhat make out figures. I looked over at my friend who had his head completely down and did not say a single word. He was known for being a complete goofball and wild, a funny dude. I had never seen him look so shaken and serious in my life. He had this look on him that still haunts me to this day. Knowing him as the fearless leader type of our group and seeing him so shaken up and afraid was really unsettling. I started to say something along the lines of, what the hell is, before he cut me off and told me to be quiet, face forward, and to not pay attention to any of the sounds. I did what he said, and the next three or four minutes were completely uncomfortable and terrifying. I remember feeling sick to my stomach and feeling hundreds of eyes on us. By the time we reached his house, the sounds had stopped. We both grabbed what we needed and headed back. That's when I could really listen to the sheer quietness of the night. No birds, no sticks falling, no sounds of leaves absurdly silent. We walked back to the campsite and nothing else occurred that night. Still my most unsettling and bizarre experience that I've ever experienced. I have no explanations for it, and I know we could have just been nervous, and obviously him setting the mood originally made us a little on edge. 
But there was something more. There was something out there. This last story is actually a personal story of mine. I didn't write this down, so I'm gonna try to tell this the best I can from the top of my head. Hopefully you guys will enjoy this more organic version of storytelling. So when I was about 18 or 19 years old, give or take, me and my best friend from Brazil, Eric, decided to go camping just behind our house. There was this set of woods that was used as a small hiking trail slash nature trail that kind of connected our apartment complex to this little shopping area that was kind of high-end and fancy. We really liked hanging out there for the obvious reasons. It's clean, it's nice, you know, people are normally pretty accepting. So one night, we decided that we were gonna camp in this area. I'm not really sure if you're allowed to, but it was something that we decided to do every so often just for the fun of it. So we found this little nook. You have to kind of go up a five foot maybe embankment and then you go down on the other side and it goes into like this little quarry of rocks with like a tiny little creek almost. It's kind of hard to explain, but we found a spot where there were no rocks and it looked like somebody had potentially camped there before. We set up our tent. It's probably a basic two to three person tent. And all we really had in there were snacks and some blankets. You know, we were just doing it off the whim and it was kind of just something fun to do. We had a good day, nothing was really happening, and we never really had too many creepy encounters in this area. I used to have to walk through this area all the time to get back to work and stuff since I used to, you know, I lived like a mile away, I didn't always want to drive, gas was expensive, we were broke back in the day, so you know, we did what we had to do. And every so often, you would have like the feeling of somebody watching you or some creepy stuff happen. I think the creepiest thing that ever really happened was some homeless guy following me for longer than he should have and got awkwardly close whispering to himself. But, you know, he didn't seem to be threatening towards me. He was just kind of acting off and it was uncomfortable. But aside from that, this area seemed safe, right? Well, we were sleeping in the tent. It was probably about 2 to 3 a.m. at this point. And since the ground was very hard and we didn't really think about getting anything to make it comfortable, I wasn't really asleep. I was in that half awake, half not kind of state, if you know what I mean, where like you're conscious, but you're kind of sleeping, but like a, the slightest sound's gonna get you up. I didn't hear any footsteps. I didn't hear any talking. I didn't hear anything. And out of nowhere, our tent literally feels like somebody grabs it and pulls it like three to four feet, like violently. At first, I was a little shook, as you would be. I was like, what the heck just happened? I thought, I thought anything could happen. I thought maybe it's Eric's brother messing with us, but then I saw that it was like 2 a.m. and there's no way he'd be out here in the middle of the dark with no flashlight, basically being ninja quiet, and then randomly pull our stuff. So I unzip the thing, I look out there, and there's nothing, nobody, at least nothing that I saw. And then for the rest of the night, I swear I hear, I'm just hearing sounds everywhere. Maybe I'm just freaked out but it sounds like there are people around us. It sounds like there's something stalking us in a sense. But the thing I'll never understand is why were there no footsteps? I was, oh, I, I remember vividly no footsteps, no sounds or anything. And it would be impossible to creep up on us since there were so many rocks, so much debris, it would be impossible to sneak up on us without anybody hearing anything. And the force behind the pull, have you ever pulled a rug out from, un some, from under people or just from under anything? It was like that. It was so much force. And it yanked us forward. And I have to set this scene. At the time, I was probably at my skinniest. I was probably about 105, 110 pounds at, at most. But my friend Eric, he's always been a bigger guy. He's like 6'5", 6'6", probably 200 plus pounds. Always been a bigger guy. And it moved him like it was nothing at all even if you were somebody who was out there trying to mess with us there's no way our tent would have moved that far it's just impossible you know if you really think about the physics i just don't get it so for the rest of the night we kind of just sat awake tr looking at our phones hoping for the daylight and the moment the daylight cracked we dipped out we didn't even get our tent broken down we didn't even come back until later in the afternoon to grab it um we got out we quite literally ran down the trail to our apartments we got in there and we basically slept for quite a few hours finally we eventually came back, and I looked everywhere. I couldn't find any footsteps. All I could see were the drag marks of our tent. I, I, I was so shook. I, I'm still confused by it to this day, and it was really unsettling and creepy. Anyways, that's my quick little camping story. I do plan on going primitive camping very soon, so maybe I'll have something new to share with you guys. Hopefully you enjoyed this little impromptu storytelling session, and I'm not narrating it like I typically would, but hopefully you enjoy this more organic story.
This has been going on for a couple of years, but it hasn't gotten to me until now. I work as a paddle coach in Ottawa, Canada. I coach sprint kayaks and canoes, dragon boats, stand-up paddle boards, and an assortment of other ships. I work year-round, but when the water opens, I work out of a camp 10 minutes outside the city. Deep Woods and several other camps surround the club. The land next to where I work is owned by the YMCA and used for a summer camp, but the center only takes up about a quarter of the area. The rest of the forest is filled with a spider web of deep wood trails that go on for kilometers. I used to train my athletes on the tracks, but we haven't been allowed to use them for a couple of years. Anytime we go on the trails now, a representative of the YMCA usually comes and kicks us out. It all started about two years ago. I was upriver coaching a dragon boat session. We were paddling alongside the shoreline owned by the YMCA, and we were just taking a break. I heard the most chilling scream coming from the woods not too far from the shore. It sounded like a woman's, but off. As though she was struggling to get air or something. The whole boat stopped moving and stopped to listen. It was quiet for a long time until I asked if anyone had heard it. The dragon boat holds 22 people and as I asked everyone looked at me and nodded. People were quiet for some time. They were trying to see if it would happen again. The first incident happened late in the summer so I assumed it was just a camp of kids screaming at a bug or something. It happens. We decided to continue the workout when we didn't hear it again. Just as we get going, however, it went off. That scream, still the same gargled scream just beyond the tree line, and again everyone in the boat stopped to listen. I wasn't 100% sure what to do. I had never dealt with anything like this before. It was one of those things that you constantly question, not sure if you heard something legitimate or not, I beached the dragon boat on the shore so that we could take a look. Everyone was guessing that the scream source could be something from beyond the tree line, but nobody really wanted to see what it was. A couple of the more braver guys and I looked around and couldn't see anything. It was honestly a chilling situation. We all eventually decided to call it a day and head back. I assumed it was just a camp of people. I assumed it was just a camp group hiking. I assumed it was just a camp group hiking. I assumed it was just a camp group hiking the trails, and it ultimately left my mind. Flash forward to last summer. I heard the screams again only a handful of times over the season. I can't say how many times, but it couldn't have been more than three. Each time it happened, I and whomever I was with could never find where it was coming from. It was always the stretch of beach owned by the YMCA, and never anywhere else. This all happened at different points of the summer. It was never just one part of the season. I want to say that this wasn't the only weird thing going on at the club. Besides the oddly disembodied screaming, I and others would hear a few different sounds coming from the woods by the club. This would include a weird rasping wind blowing sound through the forest immediately followed by the sound of what could only be described as someone gutting a fish out loud. It's hard to explain, but I want to do the sound justice because it chilled me to the bone. The worst thing I've experienced at work is somewhat too common nowadays. It usually happens when I have my younger training group with me. With this group I primarily coach sprint canoe and sprint kayak, and the group ranges in age from the youngest being 12 to the oldest being 17. I train the kids after school, sometimes we go late just before the sun sets, sometimes I'm stuck closing the club in the dark with the kids, which usually happens. Every so often, when it's just on the cusp of being dark out, my athletes and I hear footsteps coming from the woods surrounding us. They always stop just short of the tree line. It doesn't sound like people running or anything like that, but as if someone was walking through the underbrush, just as we hear it, me and the kids always fall silent and look in the same place. This usually prompts everyone to drop whatever they are doing and hightail it to the parking lot to drive off. Now all this would have been fine. I'm a tough guy. I don't scare easily, at least. I don't think so. But a couple of days ago, Something finally put me over the edge. It's been a hot spring in Canada, allowing me to start work on the water three to four weeks earlier than usual. I was out on the water with a dragon boat crew, and we paddled down to the ranges between the beaches owned by the YMCA and the camp. Again, it happened. Everyone stopped paddling and looked and stared at the stretch of beach where the scream came from. The scream sounded different now, though. Still female, but more demonic. All my hair stood on end. The whole boat laughed awkwardly assuming it was just a club member or a member of the YMCA hiking the old trails, but I didn't laugh. 
It hit me almost immediately. It couldn't have been a member of our club because I was the last booking of the night, and it couldn't have been any members of the YMCA because it was too early in the season. The YMCA camp hasn't been opened for the season yet at this point. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true camping horror stories sent in by viewers just like you. As always, if you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to hit that like button as it helps me out a ton. YouTube is constantly trying to hide these videos from subscribers and new viewers, so it helps me out a ton when you leave a comment and give it a like. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please give this a 5-star rating over there as it helps me out a ton on those platforms. If you're new to the swamp, why not join us? Hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications to never miss a new episode as I upload them nearly every single day and all things natural and supernatural. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit yours at swampdweller.net. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. If you're on the go but don't have YouTube Premium but still want to download and listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories no matter where you are, you can download them absolutely free from Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, and pretty much anywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. If you'd like to support the swamp outside of that, maybe check out our merch store. We've got t-shirts, hats, and hoodies, plus I have new designs coming very soon. I'd love to know in the comments down below what story was your favorite tonight, and hopefully you enjoyed my own personal story that I shared. Anyways, thank you all so much for supporting the swamp. If you'd like to join me outside of YouTube, be sure to join me on Twitter, Discord, Twitch, and Facebook, and I'll see you all soon with another creepy episode.